Okay, um, well, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I was asked to talk about Group B streptococcal vaccines. And uh, this is a very exciting time, uh, in fact, for uh, those of us with an interest in Group B streptococcus, um, as I hope to uh, explain to you as we go along. First of all, a little bit of pathophysiology. Uh, so Group B streptococcus is the leading cause of uh, infection in the newborn period. Uh, particularly in the first week of life, and it's the leading cause of meningitis in the first three months of life. So really important. This uh, slide attempts to summarise the pathophysiology, that is, how do uh, babies acquire Group B streptococcus. And we divide it into early onset and late onset infection. Early onset in the first six days of life, or the first week of life, naught to six days, and late onset from seven to 90 days. And you can see the distinction in terms of frequency. So about 70% of disease in the first three months of life is early onset. Uh, we understand, we believe that early onset disease is as a result of vertical transmission. So transmission from a colonized mother uh, to her infant at or before birth. Um, and uh, in the UK, around 20 to 25% of women are colonized. Uh, about 50% of babies born to those colonized women will themselves become colonized, and around 1% to 2% of those babies will develop invasive disease. Late onset disease, on the other hand, is due to vertical or horizontal uh, transmission, and so it may be acquired from parents, from healthcare workers, from equipment, from breast milk, from a range of other uh, sources. Um, the uh, Situation in the UK is shown here. This was a study that we did back in 2000, 2001, and you can see what it shows you is the number of cases on the y-axis by age of life uh, on the x-axis. So um, seven days, 30 days, up to 90 days. And you can see that most cases uh, occur in the first week of life, as I've described. And of those cases in the first week of life, most of them are occurring on uh, day one. In fact, when you look at the uh, symptoms in these infants, most of them, uh, nearly all of them, have developed symptoms by 12 hours of age. So truly very early in onset, which clearly has implications for prevention. Uh, so for example, one couldn't give a vaccine uh, at birth to protect uh, infants against group B streptococcus because the majority of infants will have developed disease already. In terms of numbers, this is um, from uh, uh, the Health Protection Agency, and it just shows the prominence of Group B strep uh, as a cause of bacteremia in the first two days of life. You can see by far uh, the majority uh, of cases are due to Group B strep. When it comes to late onset disease, which is uh, after, in this defined here as after the first two days of life, uh, it's about number five amongst the list of pathogens. Uh, as I've said already, however, it is uh, really important as a cause of meningitis. And this was a national surveillance study uh, that we did in 2010, 2011. And it divides the um, pathogens by month of life. But the overall figure is shown here. And you can see that uh, half of all cases of meningitis in the first three months of life are due to group B streptococcus. And, and the importance of that, of course, is in terms of its morbidity and mortality. It's also important because um, having done this recent surveillance study, we can compare it to studies that were done over the last couple of decades. And perhaps as you can see from this uh, table, the incidence of neonatal meningitis has not changed uh, over uh, nearly 30 years. Um, the case fatality rate did decline from the uh, 80s through to the 90s. Uh, which is probably attributable to the use of third-generation cephalosporins. Uh, but since the mid-1990s, the mortality hasn't changed. So there is uh, an important burden of disease uh, that is uh, not changing. We can compare our data with that from other countries, and this uh, is a comparison with recent data from the USA, just, just demonstrating how prominent Group B strep is as the cause of meningitis. This is in the first two months of life to compare with the US data. I mentioned the case fatality. This is shown here by uh, gestational age. Uh, premature infants have a higher uh, mortality, as you might expect, from group B strep, as they do from all uh, neonatal infections. So in um, uh, the UK, early onset disease, 24% uh, of infants uh, uh, less than 33 weeks of gestation uh, died from group B strep here. Um, 
uh, similar figures from the USA. The overall figures between the two countries uh, for these time periods are, are fairly similar. And we also looked at the cause of deaths from death certificates uh, in uh, England and Wales uh, in this period of time. And this just demonstrates again how important Group B strep is because it was the most important cause of infection-related uh, death uh, in the neonatal period. I mentioned morbidity. This is clearly an important issue for meningitis. Uh, so uh, infants and children with meningitis have, of course, uh, long-term or may have long-term sequelae. Uh, it, with regard to Group B strep, uh, it is significant. So a study from the UK and a study from a more recent study from the USA both show similar findings. So around 50% uh, of uh, infants with Group B strep meningitis have disability at five to six, seven years follow-up. So a really significant burden. Uh, you can't see the detail here. This is a, um, a systematic review of the uh, global literature on group B strep and essentially what it shows is that group B strep is an important cause of neonatal infection in many parts of the world. Um, you might appreciate some, um, I'm sorry the point is not working, but you might appreciate some uh, points to the right up here which is the higher incidence and in Africa, studies from Africa, the incidence of group B streptococcal disease appears to be uh, uh, higher than it, than it is in uh, North America, or it was in North America and in parts of Europe. And this is really important because it's also associated with a significantly higher case fatality. The key thing is that in many parts of the world, group B strep is a, a very important cause of neonatal sepsis. This is the case fatality data from the same systematic review, uh, and it shows that the overall case fatality was 10%. Um, it's slightly higher for early onset disease, disease in the first week of life, than for late onset disease, and it was significantly higher in low income countries, so 12% versus uh, 5% or so. The other place that group B strep uh, has an important role is in pregnancy and the effect on the pregnant woman. Uh, these are data from uh, North America showing a significant incidence of invasive group B streptococcal disease in pregnant women. Um, which is 0.12 per thousand live births. Uh, even more uh, important, perhaps, well, as important, is the effect on the fetus. So where the pregnancy outcome was known for these women who had invasive group B strep, 61% uh, had a spontaneous abortion or stillbirth, 5% uh, of the live-born infants had clinical infections, 4% uh, went on to have induced abortion. So only 30% were born without an apparent illness. Now, with regard to pregnancy, there are also some um, known unknowns, uh, to quote a famous uh, US politician, uh, and that is the contribution of group B strep to prematurity and the contribution of group B strep to stillbirths. And um, this is really important because the health ec economic implications of both of these, particularly uh, the effect, potential effect of group B strep on prematurity, are very significant. And essentially, we, uh, there is evidence to believe that group B strep may result in premature birth. Now, the size of that effect is really unknown, and I think the, the, the answer to that won't be known until we introduce a vaccine. Um, the contribution of group B strep to stillbirths is also uh, known, but the size of the effect is unknown. But these are really important in terms of health economic evaluation. Now, as you may know, um, we do have a way of preventing early onset group B strep disease, and that is intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. And there are various strategies for doing that. In the UK, we have a risk-based strategy, so women are offered antibiotic in labour if they have one or more risk factors. In the United States, currently, they have a universal screening or swab-based screening uh, strategy in which women are swabbed at 35 to 37 weeks gestation and if they're found to be carrying group B strep they're then offered antibiotics in labour. Uh, in the USA you can perhaps see from the graph the significant <coughs> decline in early onset disease in the red line uh, over the period of time in which screening was introduced. A two-third reduction in the incidence of early onset disease. Late onset disease uh, which is the blue line, hasn't changed. So intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis has no impact on late onset disease. 
Now, in the USA, there has been no change in the incidence since 2007. So though it has made a big impact on early onset disease, they are now stuck at a certain level. Pregnancy-associated uh, pregnancy group B strep also might be uh, influenced by intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis, although uh, it's biologically less likely. There was a reduction in disease in pregnant women coincident with the introduction of that uh, policy in, in the US, but subsequently there has been no change. So the, the round dots along the bottom rec uh, represent pregnancy-associated group B strep. So that is essentially unchanged. In the UK, um, uh, so I compare here early onset disease uh, in the UK with that of uh, the USA and late onset disease and then total figures. So early onset disease um, uh, in more, re more recently uh, over these years uh, is fairly uh, stable in both uh, the USA and the UK, a slightly higher incidence in the UK as you can see. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, similarly, uh, late onset disease where the incidences are fairly similar and, and the total incidence in uh, both uh, nations uh, is shown there. And um, for both of them, I guess the main thing to see here, though it's a bit higher in the UK, which uh, I think the, the main reason for that would be the difference in approach to prevention with a risk-based strategy uh, likely to have lower efficacy than a screening-based strategy. But in both um, countries, the incidence is now fairly stable and stuck at this level, so we need to do something else. So what is that something else? Well, that is vaccination. And uh, this is uh, one of many um, evaluations of the cost associated with different strategies for preventing Group B strep. Um, Risk-based screening, uh, swab-based screening, no screening, just leaving things as they are, and vaccination. And perhaps you can see vaccination uh, which is number three, at any incidence over a very low incidence, uh, an incidence lower than what we have at the moment, uh, it is most cost effective to introduce vaccination. So how might we do that? The vaccine targets are uh, several. Capsular polysaccharide, the basis of uh, many of our current uh, vaccines against meningitis, pneumococcus, meningococcus, Haemophilus influenzae type B, and there are also uh, surface proteins, some of which are conserved and which might also serve as uh, candidates for a vaccine. Um, the current strategy is based around the capsule, however. Now, the important thing about the capsule is that there is more than one capsule. Now, you'll be pleased to know that though there are more than 90 serotypes uh, of um, uh, pneumococcus, that's not the case for group B strep. It's a lot more restricted than that. Uh, and in fact, this shows you a, uh, the, the review we did of, of the, uh, the literature on serotype distribution globally. And you can see some prominent colours there. So green serotype 3, uh, which tends to be the most important serotype uh, uh, causing invasive disease. And some others, serotype 1A, 1B and serotype 5. So a limited number of serotypes cause the great majority of disease. Uh, so they are the serotypes to focus on in developing a vaccine. In fact, the history of vaccination uh, goes back some time. It was first recognised by Rebecca Lansfield in, in the 1930s that protection in mice could be achieved using uh, sera directed against the capsule. And then Carol Baker uh, in uh, the mid-1970s demonstrated nicely that low levels of naturally occurring antibody in the mother correlated with increased susceptibility of her baby to disease. Uh, these are, these are uh, quite recent data from North America. I'm not sure whether you can see them, but simply what they've done here, it's actually old data that they've reanalyzed, just looking at the relationship between uh, antibody in mothers and disease in the infants. And essentially what it shows is that um, uh, infants or mothers of infants who go on and develop disease have uh, much lower levels of antibody than mothers of infants who don't go on and develop disease, but who have the same exposure in terms of carrying a, a, a group B streptococcus. Uh, in fact, when it, this is comparing the antibody levels here, when you look at the risk over a particular antibody level, which is 0.5 microgram per mil, with regard to serotype 3, the most common serotype, it's a 90% reduction in the risk of early onset disease if the mother has an antibody level of above 0.5 microgram per mil. The first studies with this vaccine were done in the uh, 1970s with a polysaccharide 
a capsular polysaccharide vaccine. It's a simple polysaccharide vaccine, and it showed a modest response. The solution to a modest response with uh, polysaccharide vaccines is to conjugate that polysaccharide to a protein, which is, of course, what we've done with the pneumococcal conjugate, the meningococcal conjugate, and the hip conjugate. And that was done here, uh, and that was conjugated to a tetanus toxoid. Uh, and in the mid-1990s, the first human study was done. And then in 2001, the first pregnancy study was done with a conjugate vaccine. Subsequently, uh, lots of studies have been done with all the important serotypes, these serotypes for which there are now uh, data on the immunogenicity in um, uh, women, uh, uh, now cover, the, the serotypes covered, cover the great majority of disease-causing strains. A range of other studies have been done also looking at the importance of adjuvants or not, the number of doses, different conjugates, so a CRIM197 conjugate instead of a tetanus conjugate, um, for example. Uh, and uh, all of these have shown good, uh, very good immunogenicity in this population. Another enticing uh, study has shown potentially an impact on colonization. So I mentioned earlier that around 20 to 25 percent of women in the UK are colonized with group B strep. So if that could be reduced or if acquisition could be delayed or stopped, that would have an effect on exposure of the infant. If there's less group B strep around in the mother, then the infant um, is less likely to develop disease. And this was a study called the SPIN study, which is still not published. Um, for reasons that I, I'm not sure of, but it did show a, a delay in acquisition in vaccinated women. This is the pregnancy study I mentioned. Uh, this was a small study. 20 women received the uh, conjugate vaccine at 30 to 32 weeks gestation. There were 10 uh, women who received the saline control vaccine. It was well tolerated. What you can see in the graph, I think, right at the bottom in, in pink at 30 to 32 weeks before vaccination is very little antibody. An excellent response in the vaccinated women and none in the control group as you would expect. Um, uh, so that at, at delivery there was a lot of antibody that was passed across to the infant and really importantly to the infant out to two months of age they still had levels of antibody that were well above baseline. And then if I just, uh, as I mentioned before, in a recent study looking at levels required in the, in the mother at delivery, these levels are way above that 0.5 microgram per mil uh, that was associated with a 90% reduction in early onset disease. So this is very, very exciting and encouraging data with regard to this vaccine. So the vaccine is now being developed by Novartis, and these are some, study, uh, some slides courtesy of Novartis just to demonstrate the, the, the program that they have uh, moved through. They've got a trivalent vaccine uh, covering the three important serotypes. They have demonstrated the importance of dose um, uh, and the, the need for an adjuvant, and they, it doesn't need an adjuvant. So it, this was a study in which an aluminium uh, adjuvant was uh, tested, but it made no difference. So this is a, a vaccine that doesn't have an adjuvant. Uh, and in studies uh, done in uh, South Africa, they refined the dose. Uh, this, this just shows the immunogenicity compared to placebo. So all of the lines to the right um, with different doses, but demonstrating high levels of antibody uh, in this population. With regard to safety, all doses well tolerated in both non-pregnant and pregnant uh, women. The immunogenicity I've mentioned, there are very uh, high and specific antibody responses and the dose has been defined. The next stage for Novartis is to conduct large-scale pregnancy studies to demonstrate the efficacy of this vaccine. Now, demonstration of efficacy is, uh, can be done in various ways, uh, both uh, in terms of clinical disease or preventing clinical disease, but potentially based on serological correlates of protection. And I showed you earlier some data which has begun to establish what levels are required to protect. Now, of course, this is also a time where there is um, a much more positive attitude towards vaccinating in pregnancy. And this is a really big change on the situation perhaps five years ago, certainly in developed countries. We should note in developing countries, of course, the tetanus vaccine has been given in pregnancy for uh, several decades and has been a, a particularly well-accepted um, uh, vaccine uh, in that setting. A number of uh, vaccines have now been used in pregnant women, and indeed a number of these are recommended either routinely or in uh, appropriate circumstances. 
Uh, and of course, we're familiar with influenza vaccine. We're particularly familiar with pertussis vaccine. And I think some data on that were presented to you this morning. Uh, I think the pertussis vaccine uh, uptake has been uh, amazing, actually, um, uh, in the UK. Uh, you know, nearly 50 to 60 percent of women receiving this vaccine um, uh, during pregnancy. And this is very encouraging uh, in, in terms of using pregnancy as a platform for delivering a vaccine to protect young infants. Uh, some work has been done by Matthew Snape and, uh, and uh, colleagues in looking at the acceptability of a GBS vaccine in pregnancy. And, and I think you can see the details in the handout, but this is from the publication. Essentially, the, um, the respondents to this uh, large um, survey of opinions were very positive about a Group B strep vaccine uh, in pregnancy, which is really encouraging. So I think this is my final slide. This is a disease that we need to prevent. Uh, the currently available strategies for prevention, which are all about antibiotics in labour, are satisfactory, but they have to be seen as a short-term um, uh, way of preventing a small part of group B streptococcal disease. And as, as with other significant causes of childhood bacterial meningitis, uh, vaccination provides the best prospect for successful prevention. There has been very exciting progress over the last three years, both in terms of a vaccine and also in terms of acceptability of vaccination in pregnancy. Uh, so we need to start planning how we're going to implement this vaccine. Thank you.